It's great to be here amongst you. So yeah, Susan was saying we know each other through the New York photo community, but this is our first chance to have a conversation. Um, so we're doing that in front or a, com a, a conversation <laughs> like this. That's not like a coffee, you know, <laughs> a casual conversation. So we're we're lucky to get to do it with all of you. And um, over the last few days, you know, thinking about um, this process of being here and uh, our roles as mentors in the incubator program and the conversations we're having, we've been thinking a lot about this changing life of an image, um, of an artist's image and a body of work over time, and then the changing life of the, its frame or the frame of that image and how our own practices, um, you know, that's part of what we're doing. And it's really fitting to have this conversation, of course, after the discussion of growing like a tree. Um, yeah, because we've been thinking about this growth and this change of an image or a set of images um, within the worlds of our work. And um, so, yeah, we're going to start from, by hearing from Susan yeah, about a body of work over a period of time and how it began, how it shifted and grew yeah. in different contexts. And Trying to think about um, some of the questions that have even already come up in the incubator, if you're a practitioner, and, you've, and even Sorab in the last session and independently talking about the box. And so we're going to talk about the box, the white cube box on one hand, and the box as an artist, how do you get out of a box that others might put you in? And so I think when I was literally at midnight, <laughs> Lucy and I were going back and forth how to do a dialogue where we can share something about a process um, share with you, but in a kind of like a leaping, a stone across the water, which you know, this is not going to be the full story by any means. It's just points in a process. And I wanted to share that because I think it's part of what is in people's minds. I mean, I'm starting with the most obvious image because it's a privilege to be here. It's a privilege to travel. Many of you have had that opportunity. You know that to become a trusted observer is kind of an extraordinary opportunity in life to experience, in my case, I went to Nicaragua just after the assassination of an opposition newspaper editor, 1978. It was not visualized in the New York Times. I wasn't sent on assignment, but I read about it and I just thought the only way to know what's happening is to go. And I think many of you have worked in that tradition, so I want to honor that tradition of just instinctively going somewhere, not knowing where it's going to lead you, and in my case, how long it's going to keep you. And I think that's a really important premise of my practice, is to just let that flow. So yes, there was a time, this is the time that the Samosa dictatorship had been in power for nearly 50 years. I'm an American, the U.S. has supported that family for a long period of time. So I go with a very rough idea of what I'm going to find. But of course, very quickly, it becomes something else. And I think that's, again, in terms of practice, this question of responding to what you find um, and that unpredictability, which, again, I want to underline. Of course, you have no idea what's going to happen to the photographs you make. And I think that's okay. In the analog days, you truly didn't even know what you'd shot. You know? So some of you are doing analog. You would remember this. Um, I didn't see my film in the time I went to the first trip to Nicaragua for six weeks. I simply was making photographs. When I came back with my film, the big shift for me, I had done another body of work. This is the, that, that work had led me into the Magnum Collective. But this is the first time I'm not working um, really for the media, but the media begins to use my work. And that was a really important shift for me. I know many of you have worked for newspapers and some people in the incubator have already talked about how important it was to leave the newspaper. <laughs> I never had that experience. Sometimes I can be on an assignment. More often I'm self-assigning. So what I'm going to give you is just some 
sort of key juncture point. So this is the first time my work is on a cover of a magazine. It's kind of like, wow, there are all these people who are going to know where I am and what's happening, and some part of that's very compelling. But the real excitement was, after whatever work had been published, bringing together a book, and I know many of you dream of this too, whatever body of work you're generating the project, to bring it together in the form of a book. And we said we were going to talk about books, which we might come <laughs> back to, but you know. We've had so many different themes of this yeah. talk that have uh, come forward, but you know, yeah. they're all threads. They're part of a bigger They're picture. all threads, yeah. and, and, but I want to register that when I did the book, I was very conscious that this was a book that was going to live between Nicaraguans and at least Americans. Whether or not it would have another life beyond that, I didn't know. But I definitely knew it had to speak to two very different communities who knew the work, in a very different context. One mediated, literally, through images published, the other living it, right? So that's a distinctive, and, and some of you are doing work where I'm sure that's a relevant um, question. You know, how does the, who is the work for? And I very early on felt the work belonged to them. And that's, I think, yes, my copyright was on it because Magnum fights for copyright, and I certainly would support that. Um, the work was distributed internationally, but really, you know, I felt it belonged in Nicaragua. So one of the first things that happened that, again, listening, we talked yesterday, I think there was a lot about listening to the people you're working with that came up with Wasif, you know, learning from the field. I feel like I've really learned from the field. The, learn, the field is the field of the ways in which images begin to live in the world. So the first thing I discover in the first anniversary is that the picture, if you remember, that was on the New York Times cover is flopped, but it becomes a tourist poster for that town to invite people to come to Nicaragua. So that was kind of an amazing, who, who, however they figured out how to do that, nobody called me up and said, could we use your photograph and we'll leave it, you know, but it was in, in kind of exhilarating. The next thing, and, and this probably we can talk a little more about, is this shift to wanting to deconstruct the process I'd just been through, you know, and this becomes the first time I, I called this mediations in 1982, and it was like what Sorab was just talking about process, what lies behind, what's the outtakes, what's left out of the process. So what I did was a show that where you see the pages of the book and framed work that was already becoming part of collections in you know, it could have been an individual collector or a museum, and then the various international magazines that had used the work. And below that is, in the black, those are the original Xeroxes. This show was in 1982, so it's, a, it's kind of amazing. <laughs> They're still laminated, surviving the process, but I was trying to register the images that I had to think about in bringing in the narrative of the book I was creating. And what you see in between the mask in the middle, let's say, and the next image over is the back matter. Another thing that happened in bookmaking at this time was that if you had a book in multiple languages, it was much cheaper to print it all, all the color plates together. So I constructed a back matter. So it's a very cinematic process. You don't know anything as you're looking. You're living it kind of alongside me. And then you get to the back matter and hopefully... You, you read the statistics, you read primary material. We were talking, I think, Wasif also, you know, his installation, including documents, etc. I was looking for various fragments that could textualize. Yeah. No, I love how a couple slides ago when you showed the first book image, you know, right mm -hmm. away we heard your intention of mm -hmm. the audiences for that book. Yeah. And then, yeah. you know, you knew that you wanted to reach these audiences, but then a couple of years later, you show the audiences for this show how you built that, the yeah. whole process for yeah. how that yeah. was Yeah, I wanted to yeah. strip it, deconstruct it, yeah. make it visible. I think, you know, one primary, and, and I'm sure we all have this feeling, I mean, it's a little different with the Internet because there's so much more than we can possibly make sense of. But in that time you would ask, well, why did they choose that picture for the cover? Why did they have a double spread of this? And, and you, if you saw the whole show, you'd see 
That's Geo Magazine, which at that time was very deluxe, even more than National Geographic, really robust photographs. And then you get something in Time Magazine, and it was like this. So the difference of how you experience material and whether or not as an audience picking up the magazine you ever ask the question, so what am I missing? What didn't they want to show me? Which I think is so important today, the way we think much more critically about other perspectives that we're not getting, you know? Right, or how in your own show you were um, just really putting out there mm. the changing context in which we're experiencing each of these images yeah. and then themselves yeah. as a body of work, yeah. too. Like, yeah. what is that yeah. order, and, that sequence? And if that, I'd had yeah. a little more togetherness, I would have loved to have found out who did buy that photograph of Samosa <laughs> Where is the is it in a collection, and why did they choose it, and not let's say the mask, which is you know, or you look above and Geo crops it, and then Jap a Japanese magazine flops it. This was making me crazy at that time. It was kind of like because you had no control, you had a control over the frame, but not the reframing, and so that tension was just make making me crazy in terms of why was I working in this way I mean previously I, I'm not going to go through the whole project of carnival strippers but I'd made something totally myself for three years had no interventions so this was a major confrontation of intervention yeah well, and not, I, not comfortable not not really comfortable good you worked through it by public uh, yes I worked through it <laughs> I, I'm, I'm still working through it actually <laughs> I mean, I'm not going to show you the whole work through, but this is the 10-year mark, and I, we don't really have time, but I think it's important to just acknowledge. So I go back 10 years later. I called the film Pictures from Revolution. I was trying to find the people in the photographs, and that was just this obsession. They've been living this revolution. I had gone on and worked in El Salvador, Guatemala, other parts of Latin America, but how do they feel? They participated. Now, I know I was just thinking with, you know, there's some of you who've lived a history here, and I'm sure that's very current. Prasip, we, we were talking about that in our five-minute exchange, you know, the revolution or the insurrection or the movement here, how people resolve that. This is very much what was going on in Nicaragua at the 10-year mark. The Contra War had been very brutal, supported by the U.S., so this is a film where I literally take the pages of the book and turn the pages and see if I can find people by going back to the place I made the picture. And I think it's a really, um, I, I mean, well, I'll, I'll show you a very, very short thing in a minute. You'll see that how that migrates because that's a stage of a process. That's the 10th anniversary. And then the next iteration really was the 25th anniversary. And the question was, what does this history mean in an ongoing way to the people who live in this place? And that's, um, this, we made a very short film called Reframing History, and the idea was we brought 19, the, the revolution, the in, triumph against Samosa was July 19th, 1979. So we took 19 murals, went back to four towns, and I worked with the Institute of History at the local university, so it wasn't me decorating the landscape with my pictures, but more trying to negotiate a question about what does this history mean to the people who lived it or only heard about it. And this was really, uh, for me, this is 2004, huge, again, beginning to open up more layers, you know, of history. How does how do the images continue to be relevant, yeah. you know, if any? And also, I mean... I don't yeah. want to interrupt, but no. maybe this will be a question later. Yeah. Just this idea of an artist's practice mm. in going back and mm. looking back at your work. I mean, Sarah was talking about an artist as curator mm. Um, mm. and what that can mean, what possibilities mm. that gives you, yeah. in a sense. Um, and as the, the, the person who made the pictures, so not a researcher going back, but... Right going back into your own experience and... Um, yeah, and your own yeah. archive, which yeah. many of you have. I mean, I was talking with Shahadul about the Drick archive, what's there, you know, who's going to do the work to preserve it and to reinterpret it and all of that. These are really... So it, it's, a, a, it's, it's a privilege to have the archive and still be around to look back at it, I would say. So I'm just going to show you one, one or two more things related to this process. 
um, because I think this this will speak back to what we were doing. So this is the 30th anniversary. It's actually Aperture that reprints the book. It had been out of print. And I customized an app which is really an augmented reality. I hope you could, maybe you couldn't read the subtitles, but he's basically talking about um, rethinking for himself the act of being part of the revolution. Um, what for me I wanted to do was really disrupt exactly what I had made in the book, which is, you know, you turn the pages and you think, oh, that was the insurrection. And I wanted to bring the people who were part of it back into the process to, in a way, dislocate you in time. So he, that's a clip from Pictures from Revolution that's maybe two minutes. It, it's signaled, it's t triggered by the image itself. And every image doesn't have a clip, but many of them do. And you go through the book and suddenly you, you're invited to actually meet the person who's in the photograph. Um, and so this, this will be coming back to us because we've been talking about decontextualizing and recontextualizing. I'm just going to show you one more image. Whoop, that, not that. Um, so last week I installed in Antwerp at FOMU. So it's just, again, I think Lucy and I want to talk about this relationship, the collaboration, what happens when you bring your work into different environments. This was, uh, you know, I made this 10 days ago. It, reframing history is projecting. The mural is physically there. The original one that's from, you know, so it's like, I don't know, 20 eight years old or something? No, it's 18, I don't know. Anyway, <laughs> you know, it's kind of like the materiality. I wanted it to be present and, you know, for them to be present. Yeah, so. and each of these examples that you're showing, I mean, in a museum now, yeah. uh, what um, aspects of the material need to come forward at that time in that yeah. place? You know, what's urgent for you about bringing the mural in at this moment? Yeah. Yeah. Um, at this yeah. time, yeah. looking back on well, the life of that. And, and what you know very well is that, you know, you're lucky if a curator is interested. So Sorab was <laughs> lucky that Leandra invited him. And, you know, Buno is invited, lucky that she was part of this process. But, you know, you, it's not easy to find a curator who gives you either the, their space. Think of it that way. It's their space. They can do anything with it. And they want to collaborate with reinterpreting the work in some way they want to re-energize the work and each time the show goes wherever it does it's a different community and that's an important aspect of it I mean I can say that when I said some parts of this history are very painful still this is two days or three days after Ortega a former Sandinista leader who's now the president others would call him a dictator like Somoza um, released 222 political prisoners. And most of the people coming to that exhibit would never have either known it, thought it, maybe even cared about it. But of course, that's the torture I carry. What does it mean to celebrate the past of an insurrectional dream in relation to what's happened to the lives of, of many who participated? Yeah. And it's more complicated than that, but that's the trigger. The work doesn't just live as a picture, an object, a thing that can be sold or shared, you know, it has other resonances, you know. Right. So in contrast to that, yeah. do you want me to do this? Or, or you can, uh, you tell me, or okay. you can do it. Sorry. Which do you want? Yeah. yeah. Like this. Go. Um, this is a picture, a very recent picture at MoMA, um, of a collection exhibition at which you see uh, Susan's work <laughs> um, in the white cube space as part of a bigger collection installation. Yeah. So this, my uh, colleague, my wonderful colleague, uh, Roxana Marcoch, 
organized this show, which is called Ourselves, um, photographs by women artists from the Helen Kornblum collection. And Helen is a wonderful uh, collector and supporter of the arts who had built this collection over a long period of time. And we're lucky that she's part of the MoMA community. And now this collection of work by women artists lives at MoMA. So mm. these works... Um, have come into MoMA's collection, but here they're shown in the context of, of the books in which they were a part or there in the vitrine, you see, and on the wall amongst other works by women artists, so in a group show, um, but in the yeah. white cube space. Yeah. Um, <laughs> do you want yeah. to talk about being part of that well, collection? Just briefly? Yeah, yeah, I mean, obviously, any of you, and certainly I am always happy to have somebody interested in something and bringing me into dialogue with other work. You know, and this was a historical show. This, How many pieces were? Oh, gosh. It's Good huge. question. It was a, a beautiful installation where, yeah, so many constellations, I think was the word, the clusters, clusters was the word that Sarah used about mm -hmm. um, growing like a tree, but these kind of clusters mm -hmm. of conversations of different models of making work. Um, yeah, and it was an interesting process with yeah. Roxana and Helen. I mean, Helen has these two pieces, and she kept back one other piece that she has <laughs> that she didn't want to let go of yet, but she might at some point. Um, and Roxana, the, the senior curator, was really, really thinking about what doesn't MoMA have and what would they like to complement their collection, which is something you're doing all right. the time, probably. Right. And that, would, that must have been a fascinating process, you know. Yeah, some yeah. of these examples in this collection were artists who were coming into MoMA's collection for the first time. Um, we're lucky to have in the collection yeah. this body of work by Susan Carnival Strippers, which she mentioned earlier, yeah. in full. But here's right. a case where an image or a couple mm. of images are mm. coming in yeah. without the rest of the body of work, and they're living here amongst friends amongst um, other images to tell yeah. a story. Yeah. Yeah, and I, I remember asking Helen when she acquired those two, I said, so is it because I'm a woman making the pictures, or is it because these are pictures of women <laughs> in my way? And she said, oh, I never thought the mask was a woman. I said, of course it's a woman. <laughs> you know, I mean, and that's really important information to me, that there's a woman behind that mask, and she's, um, you know, um, hopeful. Very, very, she was very, very hopeful. So, yeah, should we? Sure. So now um, we're segueing into just this idea of the White Cube uh, collection gallery space at MoMA um, and how it can be a shifting frame for the works that come into it. Um, you know, I'm right now specifically going to focus on the collection galleries um, and and taking one sort of case study as an example. So um, Susan's work in Nicaragua, she went in the 70s, so those first pictures were made in the late 70s. Um, I've been working in a number of collection galleries at the museum, but this one in particular, Gallery 419, is uh, focusing on work from the 70s. So um, when the museum recently reopened in 2019 after an expansion, we no longer had photo galleries per se, um, which used to be a standalone place where all of the medium specific galleries had their own spot in the museum. We wanted to think more about the collection as a whole. However, within that um, collection as a whole, there are places where we've concentrated photographs, um, for now at least, and one of them is this gallery. That's uh, So when we reopened in 2019, um, this gallery started with just four bodies of work by four photographers on the four walls of this white cube. It's literally a square gallery, so mm -hmm. it's, it's a cube. Um, and two of those bodies of work were actually... Um, works that people had known and loved well for a long time at MoMA. One of them is, uh, in this picture, Daito Moriyama's work in Japan. And actually the presentation that I did here with exhibition designer is influenced by, modeled after the, the 70s 
um, mm -hmm. installation that Sharkovsky and the photographers did in this new Japanese photography show in the 70s where a lot of these uh, pictures have been in the pages of a magazine. And so um, that display like that um, with a shelf, I think, speaks to that magazine display. And then there were also pictures by Gary Winogrand, who's had a long life at MoMA. So these were like old favorites or something from the collection, mm -hmm. alongside two bodies of work that were new to the collection that had never been on view before, um, which were um, these works. And uh, you can Miguel? see some of them. Yeah, these works by Graciela Iturbide, made in Mexico, and then also Miguel Rio Branco, Brazilian photographer, but in New York. He had come to New York in the 70s. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah. So this is a, a detail of that installation. Um, these are on silver paper, uh, these cars, so you see the metallic feeling of the car through the picture itself. Then, of course, you know, photographs can't stay on view in the same place forever at the museum, so we changed the galleries. And since the museum has been reopened, um, this idea of a d dynamic and changing collection, of course, it's a must because of conservation <coughs> reasons, but it's also really important to the identity of the museum to talk about how if you're not always going to encounter the same collection in this space, this, what you'll see in this one space will change. So this is the same gallery, and actually the conceit, the, the um, display conceit is the same. There's still one, uh, so four photographers total, or four artists total <coughs> on the four walls, but we did um, change the title um, because the relationship of these artists with the city in which they were working felt really important. So we called this one Living for the City. And here um, the four artists are, so that long line of images that you see behind the case, that is Takuma Nakahira with his circulation project in 1971 in Paris. So he's working in Paris, but documenting the city over the course of the day, developing the pictures, and those are the pictures that you see. Um, and then there was also um, Richard Misrak's Telegraph 3 a.m. project in the 70s in Berkeley, his first real project, um, documenting the street, Telegraph Avenue. Barbara Branley in Caracas, um, the nervous system of the city, um, and then, actually, the projection that you see is Nalini Milani's uh, Utopia diptych uh, projection, um, where she worked with the material that she made in the um, Vision Exchange workshop in Bombay, and then added that to footage later made in Navi Mumbai. So um, we also included here the, a vitrine that showed how two of these projects existed in book form. Um, so Richard Misrak published his Telegraph 3 a.m. book, Barbara Branley's uh, Sistema Nerviosa. Um, so these are open here. And then the current iteration of this gallery is called Interiors. It has many more artists in it. Um, so we've mixed it up to an extent. And actually in the middle you see these two pieces of furniture by Gaetano Pesce from the mm. um, collection, from the design collection amongst a lot of work by photographers looking at interiors in the 1970s and what that meant in different contexts, in different times. And again, there are some works that we've had um, at the museum in the collection for a long time um, and have been on view in different contexts. And then many works here are new acquisitions or have never been shown before. Um, so just to take one example, uh, the, the display kind of opens, depending on where you walk in, but it opens with five pictures by Zofia Rydet, um in Poland, and which were gifts from the artist, but one of them had been on view before in a group show, but none of they hadn't been on view as a group, all five of them. Um, and this is a project called Sociological Record, which she started in 1978 when she was 67 years old and then dedicated the rest of her career to this body of work. Um, and in fact, in the end, made 
more than 27,000 negatives as part of this project called Sociological Record, where she went into, starting in rural Poland, um, she went into people's homes and asked them to pose with their ob objects around them, which you see are representations themselves. So these two people are holding a representation. Um, and she was making a, a sociological record of, of this world. And it eventually expanded beyond Poland into other countries. Um, she traveled to New York. And she treated, she said she wanted the subjects to be like objects themselves in their home. But creating um, this archive of images over many years, of which our museum only has five prints that she gave to us. But... So yeah, so here you saw see them, you know, in a collection gallery context, but that body of work has a, a certain meaning. Um, so yeah, so really thinking about this kind of building an archive of images, and I have to say that you know museums and mu the people that work there, museum curators, really take a cue from artists. Uh, in so many ways. <laughs> but one obvious way um, actually was when we reopened the museum uh, in 2019, uh, a work that had come into the collection that had a big place there was Dianita's Museum of Chance, which we had acquired. And um, Dianita had been thinking about building her body of work, her images, and how they lived together. And she made her own museum because she couldn't be bothered with the framework of museums um, that she was working within. And then the fact that our museum was taking that as a model, this idea of a changing museum, a dynamic museum, and how could we be that? How could we learn from that? And what um, aspects of that approach um, could work, you know, with our wide audiences, with our collection, um, and so her way of being part of the images, part of their conversation, um, yeah, was important to us. Just one other thing that I'll mention is that we have asked artists to think about our collection. And so we learned from them in, that, in a more formal way, too. And this museum has a long uh, exhibition uh, series, a long time exhibition series called Artists' Choice where we've asked artists to take on the role of curators in the museum. So I organized one iteration of that show with uh, the artist Ito Barada, who many of you will know as a photographer, but who has a really expansive <coughs> practice. And so how was she thinking about working with the objects in our collection, the language that they could share with one another, um, what themes was she finding in the works and it, I mean it was a real collaboration because um, you know not just the display of works but um, yeah how, how did we put these things together um, in a physical space is something that I could work with her on while she was bringing her own eye to the way these these objects spoke to one another, I guess yeah. I'll say. Um, yeah, and I, I mean, the other kind of thing, I was just talking about our collection at the museum and the, the kind of, we've got this frame for it, it's dynamic, it's moving within the frame, but we also, of course, have temporary exhibitions at the museum, so not just collection exhibitions, but um, over many years, if you have an exhibition series that has started a number of years ago, over time, that becomes an archive. Um, and it becomes an archive of works that are part of a whole uh, context. So this is just a screenshot of the archive of new photography exhibitions at our museum. This is just sort of the middle of it. Um, and actually, it started in 1985 um, at a time when showing new work by photographers at the museum might have had a different kind of urgency. 
And then um, it was really, the language around the show was really about giving a platform for photographers at our museum. And so it didn't have a theme. This was some work by these four um, photographers who were at different stages of their careers, of their lives. So it was never about being new artists, but more about showing new work in the museum context. Um, you know, yeah. Lucy, I was just thinking when I went to that show, you know, <laughs> yeah. and, you know, what we forget, because we all live with the Internet and everything seems accessible, but even in 85, if you didn't see it in a book form or in a magazine, then you went to the museum, and the museum was part of a kind of process of education, whether it was an American one or the Europeans. You know, I remember my travels were I was being educated by the cubes that you're talking about, <laughs> right? So somebody else was bringing things into a landscape that I could learn from just mm -hmm. to understand how work was coming. I mean, we never right. knew the back story. I mean, this is Zarkowski. I mean, it's mm -hmm. not like he, right? I mean, <laughs> he didn't tell you why he had selected. You know, we were just talking about my wanting to deconstruct so you see a process. But... And this is, this is part of what people talked to you about yesterday. How do you make these decisions? Right. I mean, right. So, like I said, he was really saying, I want to give this platform to these artists. And that's it. There's no ex right. extra. Um, I mean, sometimes over the years, the artists themselves, <laughs> their, right. their format is to work with an archive and yeah. to put it all out there. So this yeah. is the moment when Wolfgang Tillmans was but, in but that new was, photography. Yeah. yeah, I mean, that was <laughs> amazing to see. I don't know if any of you can appreciate what it was like to walk into that gallery and see that kind of an installation. This was 1996. Even in 96. Yeah. It was radical. It's funny, mention, by the way, I just have to point out yeah. how old-fashioned Mama was that we still did black and white installation views up until 2003, by the Excellent. way. So yeah. <laughs> this installation view is from 1996. The work's not black and white. But, um, yeah. but yeah, yeah, Wolfgang obviously just had a major show organized mm -hmm. by Roxana at the museum. And, yeah, so again, I mean, we don't need to go into that now, but thinking about this artist's history of starting to sh share work with audiences in this way through new photography mm -hmm. um, in 1996 and then now in a larger mm. format. Um, I have myself have worked on three iterations of this show. This one was a, a collaborative effort with other curators in our department. Um, at the 30th anniversary, we all organized it together. Um, and so this one was in 2015. And at this moment, we did want to start uh, sharing more of our framework, of our thinking about why these artists' work was shown together. It wasn't just, you know, it was a different moment than 1985. There are so many different platforms for you to experience new work. Why did MoMA want to continue this uh, project? And... So we still wanted to give a platform for new work at the museum, for sure, but we wanted to do more than that and to really talk about, you know, why these artists? What are they saying to one another? So we started naming the shows, and this one's called Ocean of Images and was really about the dissemination of images at that moment in different ways and um, how artists were thinking through that in their own work, um, and so, I mean, it was a large show. There were a number of artists in it. You're just seeing one room of it here um, with work by, in the back, David Horvitz, um, Basi Magdi from Egypt, Marina Pinsky, um, Edson Chagas with the palettes and the distributed uh, photographs. Um, then, oh, maybe I'll go to the next image here. Just uh, the next iteration um, was in 2018, and so if that one had been about images going out there in the world, this next one sort of turned inward more and, and thinking less about the outward flow, but looking at the self, looking at self-representation and imagery. So it's called being. Um, and so here you see some work by Stephanie Saihuko, Andre Steinbeck, Carmen Winant, um, this, yeah, Joanna Piotrowska is here. She was in that show as well. 
And this is looking through Carmen Winant's um, installation and the back wall is work by Paul Sapuya. Um, yeah, I, actually, I wanted to say, you know, Tanvi made this comment earlier about um, the inclusion of different artists in a group show and, um, you know, when they have relationships with one another and the meaning behind that versus expanding that. And something that's felt really urgent, and maybe in the context of MoMA and this series, is having a diversity of artists, but I mean that in multiple ways, like diverse forms, um, different stages of their careers, working in different places, you know, having different backgrounds. But with this show, actually, and I was, like, really trying to think about that and be have this expanded group <laughs> and then um, I found out later that there were these relationships amongst some of the artists that I didn't know like two of the artists had been on a residency together and had made this close bond mm. and but I l actually really loved that um, because that's yeah that's part of the context of making work and so the if one is trying to make a, a show about ideas that are happening right now, then the fact that there's a community that's maybe hidden, uh, that that didn't come to the fore, or actually two other artists went to different graduate schools, studied separately, but actually had gone to the same undergraduate college. Mm -hmm. um, so that came out later. And yeah, that was just an interesting mm. aspect of it for me. I'm gonna yeah. Be yeah, well, I told Lucy whenever we were, whatever <laughs> hour this was, <laughs> that when I went to see this particular iteration, I was just blown away. Because as you can see, what she did here, it's like you walk through this corridor of images. How many fragments from how many sources? Yeah, I don't even about know. About 3,000. Uh, 3,000 images. I don't know if you can see it well enough. They're little blue pieces of tape. Any of us have done that in a studio, you know, like when you're practicing and trying to figure out how the relationships should be. But it was, I mean, it's kind of like a Tillman's moment. Yeah. I mean, but even I didn't do this. This is the artist's work. Yes, I know. Yeah. That's what I mean. Yeah. No, yeah. you didn't do it. Yeah. It wasn't. Well, that's really important to say. It wasn't a curatorial decision. You know, it was the cur curatorial invitation for her to be and do and fully express herself. You gave her the walls. That's right. And, and actually, that's huge, this you know. place, this space is really difficult. It's like a corridor connecting to yeah. former white cubes. Now they're connected by a corridor. Um, so yeah. it's a really yeah. hard space. And actually, to have it filled like that with imagery. Um, right. But Lucy yeah. doesn't want to acknowledge this. But I literally said to her, that was the first time I said, who curated new photography? Because this, to me, was like out of the box. When we're talking about being put in boxes, using boxes, you really exploded what the box could do by giving Carmen the space. And that's not what everyone, I mean, in the same way, I think Leandra has created an opportunity for a group of artists. I mean, that's a, a curatorial position that isn't always taken. And it, I mean, the fact that an artist is working in this process that feels like a studio practice using blue tape that she uses in her studio to put up images, to talk to one another. Mm -hmm. These are all, not, by the way, not images that she made. They're images that she gathered from a particular mm -hmm. set of uh, publications because they had to exist in the world. So um, she's really focused on talking about that, about how not every image gets printed in a book. This is all; These are all pictures of birth. And uh, the books that she was finding were often made in the 70s in the U.S. by folks with a certain perspective. You know, there was some expansion from that. But she um, felt like you were going to be in the space with a lot of images that may not speak to your own experience. Um, they didn't for me and um, for many people walking through. And um, yeah, so that's what she's doing. She's gathering them and she's putting them forward for us. It's like a studio process and the yeah. fact that she's brought that into a white cube museum space, uh, it just, yeah, it's yeah, but surprising. It was, so my question immediately was, mm -hmm. What happened to the conservation department? They must have freaked out. You know, these little pieces of cut-up papers, and how do yeah. you collect this work? Actually, you can read about that on our 
website um, <laughs> because Carmen and some of our conservators talked about blue tape and how damaging it can be if you leave it on your photographs or any piece of paper for a long time. Mm -hmm. It's meant to be like quick painter's tape. Yeah. And if you leave it on, it can leave a residue. And mm. we ended up acquiring this work at the museum. So they've gone through a really long process of removing the blue tape. Mm. And um, mm. so these are, <laughs> when things come into the museum, what happens? Um, I want to mm. move on. Yeah. Yeah. Go. Well, we can come back to it. Yeah. But the last iteration of new photography, there's going to be another one coming up in May, by the way, organized by my colleague, Remy. Um, but the last one was in 2020, and the theme of this one was about images talking to one another. And actually at that moment, many things changed around it because the pandemic made it so that it didn't happen physically in the museum. And so actually the archive of who, which artists we were, um, showing their work and what images they were showing and what uh, one could say around those images, that became the whole project um, instead of a physical show. Mm -hmm. And so these are the eight artists that were included, a screenshot. I mean, this exists just like this forever, and this is the only way it ever existed. <laughs> um, and, um, and then also... Uh, over the course of a few weeks, we focused on each of the artists as we were putting this information out there. Um, but actually, the, the whole idea of companion pieces and uh, that name had a different meaning because people weren't having as much companionship with one another or they weren't coming into the museum space temporarily. And, um, yeah, so these kind of conversations among images was one theme, but then uh, companionship amongst all of us it, you know, we ended up, instead of being in the gallery space together, sorry, Sarah, um, <laughs> we uh, had to speak to each other over Zoom and share the artist's voices mm -hmm. over Zoom. And so these are three of those eight artists uh, speaking about their work over Zoom. Um, and one of them was Sorab. And actually, I just had to write this down um, or paste it down, type it down. Um, that this was right before Growing Like a Tree and Saurabh had started talking about his own work. So if you go to the museum's website and the words that are there with the, his work are that his work can be experienced like a tree with deep roots and each project or series is a separate branch. No matter how different from the neighboring ones, they're connected to other branches by a single trunk. And the, so we were talking about these images that had conversation with one another and that there were going to be these two bodies of work by Saurabh that were speaking to one another um, and that they were different from one another. But what were they saying? How were they connected? Um, was something that he was talking about with his own work. And then we got to just hear how he was thinking about his own work's connectedness to the people that had come before and other artists he was working with. So that's just a side mm. comment. And then actually this picture um, includes one of the artists, Dion, with her work that we did acquire for the museum's collection. And then it went on view um, shortly after in a collection gallery. So there she is um, with her work in the museum's collection gallery. Um, but yeah. so speaking of growing an archive of images, we're going to segue back. Um, yeah. Yeah. You know, I showed a couple of examples of how artists have thought about that for their own practice, for their own images, um, for their own work. How does this image making process growing? And then mm -hmm. how that leads to them thinking about archives mm. um, and what it means. And mm. we know that Susan has really thought about that quite a lot. <laughs> well, I, I didn't know I was going to be thinking about it. That's part of, yeah. I think what I'm going to try and do is, is bridge the gap. We, we said we wanted to think about curating and practice and what, in this case, an archive. It, it, if, it's one thing if Lucy thinks about for me, you know, like curating, and when you said 27,000 negatives of Sophia, all I could think of is where are they? Right. <laughs> and what's happening to them? What an amazing opportunity. So I don't know at what point you're in a position other than having five 
you know, gifts. Well, there's being well care. There's an amazing book of the project, uh-huh. and actually, someone just came to our museum who's doing their PhD on that project, and seemed like a perfect PhD more. for someone. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's so. It's very different process to know that that exists, or like what Shahadul was talking about, the Drick Archive, and somebody be it Vincent, who's floating around, and I know working on that archive, and um, versus collecting. And so what I'm going to shift to is an artistic practice that I didn't anticipate, but actually sh- walk you through that process, because I know it was highly criticized initially, I and mean, this is 1991, so I begin as a photographer. I think a lot of my ideas come from the field. They don't come from my sitting somewhere and saying, I'm going to go do this, uh, except I'm going to go there. And so going there was walking from, this was right after the refugees, the Kurdish refugees had fled in 1991 after insurrecting against Saddam into Turkey. I went in via Iran down the roads into northern Iraq where the Kurds had just fled from the villages. I'd read about 4,000 villages that had been destroyed, which hadn't been documented. So that's my motivation as a photographer. And I go and I'm looking at these marked mass graves. Um, Without going into all the detail, I'm really just, again, sketching a process for you. One of the things that happens in that process is people begin to surround these graves, carrying the evidence of their loved ones that they do not know if they're in that particular grave or still in jail somewhere. So my former human rights work in Latin America definitely had a huge influence for me being kind of moved by the notion of holding on to a photograph of someone. I mean, in fact, I look at this picture and I remember the Plaza de Mayo. Some of you would know that from Buenos Aires. You know, the way the ID photograph became part of a vocabulary of photography um, to demand rights for those who were missing, etc. So my work on this at this point, and it was interesting, So I wasn't, again, I wasn't on assignment. I chose to work with Human Rights Watch at that time, and they were exhuming these graves. But this magazine came out two years after I made the photographs, which was really a change. I remember at the time thinking the difference between working in Latin America where spontaneously I was shipping and getting material out, and as I was showing you, various publications did whatever they did. This is a time where the only focus is on the refugees, and not the resettlement until the resettlement begins. But what my process, and I think this, I've talked about it before, is a kind of my metaphor, thinking about Sarab's tree, my mine was digging, what digging really meant. And so I was something about seeing the past being recovered, making pictures of it, and then realizing that I couldn't really represent the history in that same way. It was gone, right? And so where did it live? It lived in photographs somewhere, maybe, and if so, where? So I began to become weirdly obsessed with this idea of being an image maker in time, going to a place like Kurdistan as much as I had to other places in which most of us make images and take them away. So where were they? And so I began a collection process in Western archives, many I spent a huge amount of time in the British public office, which I found incredible and amazing, and various other Western archives. And my process was to look for photographs of the Kurds from any period of time by anyone and try and reconstruct that history of who'd made the photograph, who was in the photograph, this kind of obsessive madness. And then I would bring the photographs back in Xerox form, and family collections began to open up and people would share the photographs they had. And so there was this kind of repatriation process beginning. And that was a very organic process. Um, This is a very simple camera that I carried around. So I was less interested in making my own photographs and more in reproducing their photographs. And this was the perfect medium, you know, Polaroid positive negative film, which is very hard to find now, but at that time it meant that a community could see the images that each were contributing. So it became a collective process, which in in itself was kind of fascinating. So just walking you through it, because again, I, I want to signal what, what the book meant. 
And in this case, the idea of a book was show this 100-year history in time so you feel the history of photography moving through it. So, you know, sepia to cold tones was important. The artifact, the broken glass plate, the scratches, who'd made these photographs and how had they been preserved became essentially the core of what I wanted to um, do with the book. So this is the Mahabad Republic, the only time the Kurds were ran their own country, essentially, uh, until the no-fly zone that I came in on in 91. All of these are a combination of documentation. And the other amazing thing is, so this began in 91. I finished the book in 97. Everything that happened in digital technology would make it possible to design this book in my studio, which was kind of extraordinary because everything was digitized. You couldn't print the book yet digitally, but you could position all the work. So I was really making this collage, as I saw it, collage yeah. of history. And the only challenge was finding a designer who was willing to read, you know, because they like doing stuff, moving pictures <laughs> around. But, you know, I say, no, 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 you don't understand the history. You've got to get, you have to match this with it. So contextualizing each of those photographs with some piece of fragment, because everything was fragment, and nothing was intended to be the authoritative history of the Kurds. So the book is called Kurd Kurdistan in the Shadow of History. It probably should have been in the Shadow of Histories, because, of course, I was stitching between very disparate work for about 100 years of work. And then the most kind of wonderful part of it was shifting to an exhibition form because I felt like the artifacts should have their time. And I was very lucky, I, we didn't talk about this, but the Manil Museum was the, were the first to showcase the, the exhibition at PhotoFest. Mm -hmm. And the curator at the time said, just come meet the framer. And I spent, you know, I was thinking about Leandra and talking about the two months of installation. I spent unbelievable amount of hours watching this extraordinary framer choose exactly the frame within, in relation to the artifact that I offered up. And, and Dominique de Manil, you know, eight years this show traveled with her antique frames, which is, again, when a museum chooses to go out of their box and, you know, generate support. It was, you know, it was extraordinary. And it traveled yeah. in many of the places where the Kurds are minority community. And the other a big idea for me about this was realizing this thing about a book being fixed. And, the, the, again, histories move on. There's so many more stories to tell. How do I deal with that? So it wasn't just... You know, Nicaragua has been kept as it was. I Although haven't. you unfixed the book. I unfixed the book with the film. But, yes. but in this case, I was trying to figure out a way, and this is, you know, again, when technology comes in and opens up a possibility. So the next picture is of AKA Kurdistan. This is 98, when, when the Internet is just opening up for an exchange of images. You can't yet do it automatically, but somebody could send me a photograph, send me a text, and there could be a vertical scroll, a horizontal scroll, and, and you could, these little dots, which you probably can't see, you could enter the homeland of the Kurds through a particular place or through time. So this was the, the, the way to extend the book at that point. Um, you know, and it's before Google search and maps and all that kind of stuff. And I think this potential of cyberspace in relation to complementing a book was so exciting or complementing even an exhibition. Yeah. So I'll just end with um, what happened in the, when they, when uh, the Jeux de Pomme decided to do a survey, the, you can see actually pretty clearly the way the homeland, that island goes across the Middle East. So it crosses into Turkey and Iran and Iraq and Syria and it's in, it, this was the map they used in 1945 to claim a Kurdish homeland. When the show first went to Istanbul, they wouldn't allow us to paint the homeland. So we shifted, and this is now at the Jeux de Pomme, the, and you can see all the little books that are hanging that came from the, the, the digital website and as they began, and there are no borders. So it's this idea of the borderless diaspora. 
And sorry, so it, yeah. the year that it was out sort of. Um, uh, 2018. So yeah, many, it went, many years. I mean, two decades. Oh, yeah, later. two decades later. Yeah. yeah. And the iteration that I was just going to end with, which this is from last week in Antwerp. Um, this woman, Suman, made a little book, and each time I bring the Kurdistan show, luck, fortunately, wherever, I look for a part of the Kurdish community who come forward, and they decide whether or not they want to tell one story or another. So this was made, you know, 10 days ago when we were opening, and, you know, you just never know where it's going to lead you, how people are going to receive the representation, the connection, which to me is is the whole challenge. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I love that you ended on this picture because um, you talked about your process in the studio, um, mm -hmm. and we mm -hmm. saw you literally working mm -hmm. as an artist in your studio mm -hmm. and the capability of doing that with what um, was available at the time mm -hmm. to make the book, but that it had been a collective process also yeah. and using the Polaroid uh, positive negative uh, yeah. to to enable that collective process and then over time the form that the mm. project has taken you know in different contexts of a, of a bigger show or yeah. a, a project that was just about the Kurdistan project but um, yeah but wait you, the sorry. one detail it wasn't my studio it was the backyard of, yeah. the backyards of the Kurds that's that picture I should have said that oh, when you okay. saw all the black and white Transparency. That's no, not my no, studio. No, I mean the next picture where we saw you in the studio. The right. So we yeah. saw both. So yeah, we yeah. saw the collective yeah. process yeah. with the Kurds. Then yeah. we saw you making the book. Yeah. In the studio. But this goes yeah. back to even the Carmen Winant work, mm -hmm. which you're allowing a shift. It's not framed work. Well, yeah. And and this was a big discussion mm -hmm. because again, when you certain museums are uncomfortable with the public just handling the art. So from my view, I was saying, no, 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 this is not about the art. This is about the connection. Right. Whatever the stories they choose to place and whatever number of stories people might read, it's about the invitation to interact with it. And, yeah. and that, that's a territory. Yeah, and it's that's quite specific here because you're really thinking about that collaboration in so many ways. Mm -hmm. There's a the collaboration with the museum mm -hmm. that, uh, or yeah. a negotiation, as yeah. it may be. Um, but then also with the audiences in each location and um, the particular yeah. stories that they're bringing to this project um, coming through and yeah. this aspect that's changing yeah. over time. Yeah. And we were, I know that we were talking in the earlier session about traveling shows and the boxes are never the same. So you're always... <coughs> in negotiation about the space, about the interpretation, the relationship to the community that surrounds the museum, the audiences the museum is comfortable with. Even for this, this museum, FOMU in Antwerp, very progressive in multiple ways, doing amazing shows, they'd never reached out to a community like this. Mm -hmm. And so for that community to then come into the museum for the first time is a whole nother part of this. And how long was this. the process of, it, of putting that together I, in I, each case? I did a workshop uh, the weekend before the installation. Okay. Three-day workshop. Yeah. Right. And right. I had no idea who would come. Mm -hmm. And you never know what stories they will want to share. And I always am trying to say it, it's going to be public. Somebody, a stranger, is going to read your story. So right. think about what what feels appropriate. And it's not about making a design perfect book. It's really just making something expressive of yeah. whatever experience they want to share. I mean, that's like so immediate. Just in case it's not clear, like in each iteration of this traveling exhibition, Susan mm -hmm. has worked with the local refugee community to bring their voices into the show through these mm -hmm. books. So it's changing all the time, and it's yeah. very immediate. We just yeah. heard. Yeah. Um, so... Yeah. Maybe we should. Questions. Yeah. Yeah. Open it up for questions. Um, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Any questions? Hmm. Shadow has a question. Well, oh. thank you both for, for that oh, wonderful, wonderful presentation. Uh, my question relates to the nature of of the show in, whether you call it a show or whatever, in the space in which you show it. Uh, here we have the luxury of having you go through it, 
go behind it and give us the backstory. Uh, sometimes, one of the things with photographs is in reproduction, they often end up in books. And when you have photographs being reproduced in books, there is a typical way of doing so. And the mechanics of it is fairly specific. When you have as complex a situation as this, and then you have to then talk about it or present it in a book, what do you do? Are we talking about explaining to an audience about the yes. exhibition well, what, or what, how yes. the book speaks to an audience? Uh, different well, things. I mean, they are different, but the point I was making is you're going through a very complex process of interaction which we had you describe to us here with this, in this audience. If you were to present it in a book, how would you do that without losing so much of this richness? Well, actually, I have a feeling I have to come to Pashala with the book because you don't have it. <laughs> um, the introduction talks about what it's like to be um, to journey on this process of the of the entire the whole process of the encounter and what it meant to be the Westerner who doesn't belong there, who doesn't speak the language, how you build the relationships and the networks. I mean, Saurabh was talking a lot about networks. These are all networks that are either various layers of networks. I'm working with local scholars. I'm working with studio photographers. One family is introducing me to another. This is a really compressed version of what I would say if I was at a university. I'd give you an hour talk about all of that. When you go to the exhibit, and maybe I should have included that, a fragmentation, there, there are cases of the artifacts that we found, very much like that earlier image, which you see the artifacts, and with each artifact, there's a story about either someone who took the picture or who's in the picture. So, like any audience, and I'm sure for, you know, for Lucy too, how much do you tell and direct? How much do you inspire engagement through the materiality of it? I mean, I was thinking about that with Wasif's, you know, it was wonderful to see it and then to hear it. So obviously there's a gap of how far did I go in the experience of his work and how much richer it was to then understand the stories that lie behind. So for me, I'm always thinking about how to do that better, you know. And so the real, if any of you had seen the show at CO Berlin, some people told me they had. It would be much more interesting to hear for them, was it overwhelming did they feel invited into the process? That was a survey show that was trying to get you from literally my first photographs to almost my last project. It's a hugely ambitious kind of survey to do. That wasn't my idea. It was a museum's idea. I mean, I was stunned they were even interested, frankly. So the, the work of the curator, the work of the <laughs> collaborator, is to figure out how do you bring people along into a process? And I start with the awkwardness of an encounter. I was terrified to even knock on a door yeah. to make a portrait. But that, you know. I mean, it's an interesting question, though, because you made the book yeah. um, after a long period of building an archive. So over mm. the 90s, you know, we heard that mm. when you began, and then over that course of that, then the book came out. Yeah. Um, but then it's continued to change. So the book wasn't enough. I mean, in a way, yeah. I think you said, yeah. you know, and you yeah. were looking to these other forms, to the early Internet, what was possible, how you could interact more, yeah. how could you explore it in an exhibition form. So the fact that the exhibition form came later and expanded the book form yeah. maybe uh, speaks to that kind of question a little bit. Um, yeah. And, and then that it's still changing because these uh, continuing stories of the refugees in each place are so much part of this. Yeah. So how do you bring them in each time? And actually yeah. there's a step in our trying to compress, like how are we going to have this dialogue conversation not knowing what either we're going to show or talk about. <laughs> that was interesting. <laughs> One of the steps I left out is that when the show was in Rotterdam, we decided to have a site-specific room and invite the Kurdish community to bring any photographs they had into the space and install them. So, I, you know, in compressing a story, that came before the website. And what the museum said is, wow, we have this great work. Don't you want to keep it? And we were just on the cusp of the technology that allowed us to digitize it. So we began, the AK Kurdistan came from the Rotterdam Museum. Again, this kind of partnership with a museum that invites you 
yeah, let's put scanners in. They don't have scanners in, in 1997 or 98. They didn't have scanners at home. We didn't have iPhones. So they made it possible, a technology that people could come, put their photographs on the wall, an extra expansion of the original show, and then scan the work, which then went up onto the website. So, I mean, all of this is in service of what, right, Shahadu? You know, how do communities feel they're participating in meaningful ways and shaping narratives that are very complex, as you point out? How much do, you know, am I speaking to practitioners? I mean, to me, the most beautiful part of the process was what is this thing to whom, you know, for whom? Um, I think that's the more, whatever I'm making, I mean, it's kind of like for whom, ultimately, you know? Who does it live longest with? How do I keep bringing it back and revisiting and trying to understand even what I made from the beginning? Um, I don't know if that is really an answer, but part of a process. It's, 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 it's learning from the process of the making by asking questions about, you know, um, I mean, at some point, something no longer animates you. You know, I can't go back to Nicaragua in the same way you couldn't be the free man that you are today some time ago, you know. So I can't go back to a place, I don't know when I can go back to Nicaragua. Um, so it's trying to wrestle with then, then what? How do I contribute in an ongoing way? Um, hi. So I've been uh, very inspired by your work, Susan, um, and when I had the chance to see the Jodi Pom show, actually. Oh. And mm. so I just wanted to say that what I found really remarkable about that show um, was that, and it, it, I'm thinking about it also because you're talking after the talk about growing like a tree, where a lot of the contextual information about work is being pulled out in the hope that the audience engages more physically or visually with the work. And um, the amount of work, the, the amount of text and context that you gave the audience about your process for each of the works, right? And the, mm -hmm. this is just Kurdistan. All of your work has this pretty much complex, collaborative, intimate, back and forth, ongoing over decades. And I spent a long time there because I also like to, to watch how people engage with work. Mm. Um, and people did all of the work of going back and forth between mm. the films and the prints and the text. And I also talked to some of the people when I was in the show. And one of the biggest things I learned was that people were coming out of it not just remembering images or this is what happened in Nicaragua or how horrible this is what happened in Kurdistan. People do walk away from your process knowing that they now have a process they can use. Mm. And that is what I find really remarkable about mm. actually the way the works were put together is that you walk away saying, I can do this too. Mm. And this is a method. And this method is doable because it involves engaging with people and it's not about being prolific about in the medium. Mm. So mm. there's a, um, there's a huge, uh, public dynam the engagement, the public engagement, I think comes because of that in your work in a different way. And I just wanted to share that, that mm. that Jodhpam show does that, even though it's that large. Yeah. It did it. Well, thank you, Asha. I mean, you know, back, back to Shadul's point though, these narratives are complex to, you don't want to be overly reductive, you don't want to overwhelm. I think that's a question, you know, you must have similar issues, you know, and I'm sure in, in Goa you're trying to figure out how much of contextualizing do you want, how much do you want the work to just be free, to be interpreted in any way. Those are fundamental questions that any curator addresses, right? And I may be too obsessive about that sharing of process. Um, I don't know. I mean, I think as a curator also, um, really, our responsibility is sharing the work with the audiences. Mm -hmm. And um, so, you know, that mm -hmm. the Jodhapam is a 
major retrospective of your body of work, mm. which has this context that's always lived alongside it mm. in different ways. Mm. And um, so that was important for that to be the way that we access it. And um, yeah, in other mm. contexts, um, yeah, we want to see the conversation between the two sets of images, say, or, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. you know, whatever it is. So, yeah. It's not mm. about always yeah. a decision that the curator is making. It's following right. the work and the artist. Right, and, and we were started by talking about being put in boxes. And, you know, I didn't say this, but when I was doing the Kurdistan work, of course people were saying, who are you to do this? Not just because I'm not Kurdish, which would have been one obvious question. Um, when we talked about it, pretty honestly, it was like I knew I could cross borders and boundaries and carry work that they couldn't. Do and so to be inclusive is in a process is different than and being responsible to the and that word came up earlier. Who are you responsible to? I felt responsible to everyone who offered me anything, you know, to make sure I did it justice in the sharing of it in some fashion. And it was also important to go back and give it back. So I think Wasif also talked about not keeping originals. You see me reproducing, right? It's not. Um, there are originals in the show that people said we'd rather you have them as if I could protect them better, uh, which in some circumstances is probably true. Um, yeah, but you're kind of inventing the method. You're not, you know, in, in terms of what it expects of you. Well, a lot of you are collecting family histories, you know, and, and Shadul, we were talking about this responsibility you have to the Drick Archive, right? And, you know, the Arab Image Foundation in Beirut has done extraordinary work, both with artists and with families, trying to make sense of what they can still find, which is a big issue. And then, um, you know, this was a particular approach at that moment. I mean, 91, it's a long time ago, you know, I might... I, maybe would never even think to do it now. Um, and they began, I think, about just as the book came out. And I remember meeting them. And they had a very different attitude. I don't know if you know the Arab Image Foundation, but there was a lot of interest in artists responding to what was in the archive. And that's a different approach, yeah. which is kind of like your invi invitation of the artist's choice well, of Ito, the collection. And, of course, Ito was part of the Arab Image Foundation. Right. Um, so it was yeah. doing the work of collecting images um, together and <laughs> mm -hmm. and had been a practicing photographer. So mm -hmm. nice mm -hmm. jump there. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> so, yes. Yeah. <laughs> Susan, you might remember many years ago in Barcelona, Christian Kijol had just casually commented on uh, Eugene Smith's response whether, had he been doing Pittsburgh today, he'd have used the same vocabulary. Oh. Uh, mm -hmm. It wasn't really taken up at that time, mm -hmm. but we were talking about it in the background of what that question actually implied. Uh, and there is this thing of the changing vocabulary. I mean, you mentioned uh, mm. digital technology coming in, allowing new possibilities. Mm -hmm. But I, I'm not merely talking about the technology, but I think at any particular point, the statement you're making is in a language that is appropriate or not for not only an audience, but a particular point in time. And that mm. shifts. Mm. And how do we shift alongside it? Yeah, I think, I mean, it's, I feel like that's the biggest challenge and the, the exciting challenge. Why am I here? Whatever I can offer any of you, I'm listening, I'm looking, I'm learning. So I think I don't feel myself fixed in a particular way. I mean, we were talking about this at some point in the last few days. Emerging versus evolving. I've decided to choose the word evolving and just 
I self-identify. Yeah, we can all identify. You know, <laughs> in other words, um, it's a process. If you're in, engaged with the process of representation and the responsibilities of it and the presentation and who is it for, I mean, when Wasif decides to go back to that village, it's going to be a major moment for him, whatever happens, however he does it, however he chooses to do it. And many of you, I mean, I was talking earlier with a few of the five-minute <laughs> speed daters. I know several of you have family archives that are trying to figure out what to do with them and what would be, you know, appropriate. How do you really include their voices in a meaningful way? Is it, you know, symbolic or is it really sincere? These are all great questions for practitioners. And I have to say that, you know, Lucy and I didn't know where we were going to go with this, but you know, I was challenged also, not, you know, not just I, that I wasn't Kurdish, but I wasn't a curator. I wasn't a historian. And so going back to this fundamental question about, you know, your process where you don't know the destination, but you commit to a process and it comes from within. It's not what, I mean, Sorab responded with an opportunity, as did, you know, Bunu. There are opportunities to grow. And then that brings other questions. And I, you know, I just wanted yeah. another thing that Susan said mm -hmm. over the last couple of days <laughs> um, was about the role of a curator, or that mm. you said something about like a curator's moment, or something. Oh, I, say, I, I said to Lucy, well, we could start with the <laughs> fact that this is a curator's era. She feels because it's a curator's era, but look I, how much work is being produced in so many multiple ways. So you, all of you, who want to be photographers. Think about it. <laughs> They've got a much better deal. It's much harder. Um, but also, I was acknowledging that at the museum, you know, we've started more and more signing the exhibitions at the museum. We mm -hmm. were talking about that and how always a temporary exhibition that you're mm -hmm. collaborating with an artist, mm -hmm. but you're signing it and you yeah, might have a book. But even those collection galleries, we've mm -hmm. now started signing. And I feel like... Um, you know, it's a privilege to be there making the choices, but it's also wanting to acknowledge mm -hmm. that this is just one um, way of looking at the work, and it isn't the history that the museum is telling that's one voice. There are so many voices that are there. Um, whose is this one that's talking? Um, mm -hmm. So it's just acknowledging that you have a position, that you're yeah. a person, <laughs> you know, yeah. and, um, yeah. Yeah, yeah one so of the toughest... subjective. The subjective, and one of the things that actually came up in Antwerp, just as a free association, mm -hmm. is there was a large Syrian, you wouldn't be surprised by this, community of refugees now in Antwerp. Mm -hmm. And they looked at the book from the index and saw how many pictures from Syria there were. And I had to say, I was... I was, and I still am, an American. And in the 90s, as an American, I could not get a visa to go to Syria. So I was dependent on how many Syrians at that time were in the diaspora. And if you think about what's happened in our sense of history of the last, what is five to 10 years, we've seen this massive exodus and destruction of that country. But in, nine, in the 90s, it was a very coherent society, and people were not leaving. And so when I was working with the Institute of Kurdistan in Paris, there was one Syrian. And it was not a healthy, vital community in the way that I interacted with the Iraqis and the Iranian, Turkish Kurds, etc. So everything is conditioned whether or not you, you know, you, you can only do what you can do. And I had to say, it's, I, it's my great regret that I wasn't able to kind of mobilize a, a larger part of their history to bring it into the book.